Our next speaker is Tim Pratt from FEC Energy, uh, a very important part of the, uh, the infrastructure. No, no robots, no machines, nothing works without that. Um, and now we've also, as part of factory or horticulture 4.0, we've got to be mindful of where this energy comes from. We've got um, environmental considerations that we've got to take into account. So I'll hand over to Tim. Thank you, Richard. I, th I think you, you started off a few minutes ago saying how the first two presentations were maybe a bit of a tangent. Um, I was sitting there thinking I was maybe even a bit more of an oddball compared to a, preceded by an MP in the presence of MBEs and I don't know how many PhDs as well. I, I'm, a, I'm a mere BSc, so... Uh, and. and I'm normally very much a here and now, what are the facts, the figures kind of person. And, and today I think it's very much about looking to the future. So I've tried to stretch myself a bit and just look a little bit further, a little bit more, sort of what if. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure how ambitious I've been or not. We shall see over the next next 20 minutes or so. So I, I think in, in what you might call the political arena, and some of you may have heard the phrase about the energy trilemma <coughs> that we're sort of grappling with. You know, we want energy to be reliable, and really I'm focusing on natural gas and electricity, or electricity probably the, the absolute top of that in terms of reliability. I think now if, if, if we lost, if electricity went off for five minutes three times a week, most of us would be fairly hacked off now. Um, interestingly, we moved the electricity meter at my mum's farm last week and the electricity was off for the day. She was perfectly happy. She fired up the, the ribbon, threw some coke in it, we had still had a, we could still have a coffee and she couldn't have cared less. There aren't many people like that nowadays, and, and businesses in particular, that could survive in, in that kind of situation. So reliability is very important to us. Increasingly, or, or obviously now, there's very much a demand for it to be renewable energy, low, low CO2 energy. And there's a bit of a mismatch there already. Now, solar panels are actually incredibly reliable bits of kit, but we can't predict when the sun's going to shine and how much. And so that destabilises the system, if you like, and similarly for wind turbines and the like. The electricity we get from this source is less and less predictable compared to what it used to be. And I should have said affordable rather than cheap, I suppose. But yeah, no, no, we, we want energy to be affordable. And affordable and reliable don't, aren't necessarily automatic bedfellows. So this is, this is the trilemma, as it's called. But... As I think about it more, I think horticulture's got a fourth dimension, which conveniently draws them into the 4.0 story. If you like. Greenhouses, and then we want CO2 <coughs> to enhance yield. And we're heading down the route that said we want low CO2, but how is that going to impact on, on, on the growing process as well? So, so maybe horticulture's got the energy quad lemma. It doesn't, doesn't quite roll off the tongue in the same way, but uh, it, was, it was the best I could do. I'm, I'm an engineer after all. <laughs> So what I just want to run through is kind of the, the three key, I think of CO2 as an energy source because it's so, in, in, it, or in the same arena, it's so intrinsically linked. So I, I'm going to go through those three sort of headings and I'm going to try and do a bit of a tomorrow's world and have a stab at what the greenhouse of the future might look, for, look like in terms of its energy sources. So first, I mean, a bit, bit of a, just go through a good news story in, in, to some extent. The UK has done a blooming good job in recent years. Since 2013, we have halved the CO2 intensity of electricity. Halved it. I mean, that's a massive step. Now, OK, we benefit. You know, there's a good old 80-20 rule. You know, the first, you get the 80% for the first 20% of effort. And by 2030, we're targeting to, to go down by more than half again. And that's, gonna, that's a big step. That's, that's a much bigger, tougher ask. But we've made massive progress in, what, five years? It's, it's quite staggering, really, when we reflect on, on, on the change that we've seen there. You might think that prices will come down. All these generators are running. They haven't got to pay for the sun or the wind. You're getting all these subsidies anyway, so the wholesale price of electricity must have come down, wasn't it? Well, unfortunately not. And th this, this shows sort of like the, the, the electricity-only commodity price, how it's been changed. So the price of electricity for this winter, £51 a megawatt hour is, is 5 pence. It's gone up by 2 pence since the start of the year, and so, and so summer electricity for, for summer next year. And you can say, well, wh why is that? Well, electricity, the price of electricity, is very much linked to the price of gas. Now, you've got to watch this, if, if you just watch carefully, because it doesn't really change much. That's the price of gas, how it's changed over the year. Electricity, gas. 
I didn't fix that. It, that that's that's exactly that so. Electricity is very much pinned to the price of gas, and gas is actually very much pinned to the price of oil. And so, in spite of all this renewables that's going on, that, that's pushing electricity onto the grid, and to some extent, as much as they want the best price that they can, they're not pri the price takers, are not price makers. If you look at some other garish looking graphs, this is this is something produced by one of the big generators. But this shows around about the summer solstice. So listen, the sun is shining as much as it possibly can. Um, where the electrics come from, so there's, there's nuclear at the bottom and bits of biomass and so on, but this big fat band here is gas. Even in the middle of the night, gas is making a significant contribution to electricity that we use in this country. You know, pretty much the middle of the day here, we're still getting 37% of the, of the electricity we use is coming from natural gas. That shows you how and why the price of electricity is doing what, what, what it is doing. Only you know, a week ago, a half of the electricity within the entire day came from natural gas. So that's, that's why there's that price connection. And really, in terms of the next steps, it's about how do we, do we replace that gas, the electricity that comes from gas. And that's not going to happen overnight. As end users of electricity as well, not only has the price of electricity gone up, but all this lovely renewable stuff's got to be paid for. And it's not just a subsidy that comes out of government taxation. Actually, the, all the renewable obligation, the feed-in tariff. I imagine many of you here have got solar panels on roofs and you get paid a nice bit of money every, every month or every quarter. Or every. That actually goes on to the import electricity bill that I pay, that you pay. And I looked at this not on, on a previous presentation I gave some time, but back now, seven years ago now, the two key green bits, if you like, we're adding half a penny per kilowatt hour to our import electricity bill. Just over a year ago, it was 2.4 pence. Now it's 2.8. That is entirely due to the payments being made towards the wind turbines, the solar panels, the anaerobic digestion. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not having a gripe about it. It's just, it's just, an, it's just an awareness point. It's, it's what we are having to pay to make these moves to, to, the, to the lower carbon arena. And so anybody who's been renewing electricity contracts of late particularly if they'd signed up to a two-year deal a bit back, well, I've got a really very scary-looking number. And it is what it is, I'm afraid. There are no magic answers or solutions to that one. But where is this all leading us? So more and more of these intermittent, um, I think they said unreliable, you know, um, unpredictable energy or electricity sources have to be managed somehow. So increasingly we're seeing and hearing a lot, a lot of noise about batteries, um, and even, to me, quite much more interesting things, that is slowly inclined railway tracks, gravity energy storage. There are projects looking at winding very large weights up and down very large holes in the ground, also known as redundant coal mines, um, as means of energy storage. Some really quite, and you think about it, you go, actually, that's pretty, that's pretty obvious. That's pretty simple stuff, really, than just a weight on the end of a rope. Um, brilliant idea. I, I, I love the concept. Um, but yeah, a lot, a, lot, a lot of talk going on around batteries and how batteries might be the future. Where we're at now, batteries in particular, they are not about bulk storage of electricity. That, that, everything is the size of a container now, isn't it? You know, that, that, that's about a megawatt. If uh, that was a fully charged battery to fully empty, that would... I mean, I, have a, I was talking to a client the other day who, who was looking at putting in six megawatts of lighting to produce tomatoes. So that container, fully charged up to fully flat, would last 10 minutes. So, you know, they are not about bulk energy storage, yet, at least. They're actually about what the <coughs> value for the batteries at the moment comes from grid balancing services. Very fast response. National grid have to keep the same amount of electricity going into or out every second of the day. They, these batteries can respond within two seconds. That's where the value lies. It's not really, yet, about fill them up when it's cheap, push it out when it's expensive. It'll come, but not yet. But I kind of then jump back to where now. Um, protected horticulture, where, whenever possible, has, has loved to embrace combined heat and power. And it's 
you know, combined heat and power still very much natural gas, fossil fuel oriented, which you know, some might say is you know, really we shouldn't be thinking about burning more fossil fuel. But it is very much seen as still as a transitional fuel. And if you think about what a conventional power station does, they're about 40% efficient. So we're throwing away about 60% of that energy, of that value as heat off a big power station. We're just throwing it away to the world. Whereas combined heat and power has overall efficiencies easily in excess of 80%, twice as much. So we're, we're taking twice as much energy value by using a CHP than a, than a centralised power station. And when we look at all the renewable stuff and the payments around that, against the savings and the CO2 impacts and the like, then actually CHP doesn't really get a lot, but it could have a massive impact. I think it were a, a relatively <laughs> small improvement in terms of incentives for, for a CHP to displace gas using power stations that throw them all the heat away to allow more and more CHP in heat using sites and processes could give us a very substantial win as a country in terms of CO2 emissions and you know, at relatively little cost compared to some things that have been done so far. So I'll, I'll, you know, one of my personal hobby horses, if you like, the CHP justifies to me a bit more recognition into, uh, than, than it probably gets at the moment. But where next? Where after CHP or, or, or big gas fueled engines? And uh, fuel cells are very much an interesting topic. I did notice in one of the biographies, one of the speakers this afternoon, I think, has spent some time working on, on fuel cells and, and the like. And, and they are something that they've just, they've got to come. It's got to happen at some point. Um, we might think about fuel cells as being the hydrogen fuel cell. You know, all, all that comes out is water. Um, but fuel cells do run on methane. It, and and, and the, they have the potential, and we can see the numbers already, that they have higher electrical efficiencies. You know, we can have total system efficiencies of 90% or more. And from a growing point of view, because it's, it's more of a chemical reaction than, than a combustion. I know combustion is a chemical reaction, but it, it's, it rips apart the methane in a much gentler sense. We get incredibly clean I suppose, flue gases, for want of a better name, from, from fuel cells. There's no NOx. There's, you don't need catalytic con converters, all that kind of stuff. We haven't got moving parts. I think, really, I'm holding out significant hope for fuel cells in the future, whether or not... I will be see fuel cells scattered around the industry in my working lifetime. I'm not too sure. Maybe I think I think one of the afternoon speakers, if he isn't talking about that, might be able to give us a little bit, a little bit of insight into where that future lies. But that's something that I sort of think. Mm, I think that's coming along at some point. And and even looking back a little bit at cost of import electricity, I am now seeing clients across many industries looking at generating their own electricity for electricity that they use only. Not to export to the grid, but I can, you know, if you look at numbers, we can burn natural gas in a small engine, use all the electricity on site. I can throw all the heat away as crazy as it sounds, and as a, as a financial investment it still works. So if we can use the heat as well, it doesn't, not entirely life-changing as far as your business is concerned, but it's a good step forwards, and particularly when we're seeing these, these massively rising import electricity costs. So, and, and, and they are quite literally just smaller versions of these engines. You know, probably the size of that desk will be 50 kilowatts, and that can make a decent inroad into some of your electricity use, maybe. So, <coughs> move, move quickly on, on to heat. We've obviously, I th I'll be surprised that there'll be no end of you in the building here that have probably gone down the route. There'll be a good sprinkling of biomass boilers sc scattered around Sussex that we see. And, you know, five years ago, definitely seven, when the RHI first came along, they were a, <coughs> a, a specialist hobby, for, for, want, for want of a better phrase. So the renewable heat incentive has had a significant impact in agriculture and horticulture in terms of you know, getting us off fossil fuels and moving us into this kind of arena. Um, so, yeah, biomass boilers all over the place. The tariff structures are changing. We're seeing an increasing interest and opportunity for heat, for heat pumps. I was talking to someone earlier who will be quite pleased I said that. I can't remember if he's moved up in the room at the moment. Um, but, yeah, heat pumps look particularly interesting now, albeit they do use electricity, and I've just said the price of electric's going up. Well, 
Yeah, there's, st there's still some potential wins there. But the renewable heat incentive as it stands closes in March 2020, so I'll just say to anybody here, if you are still thinking about you know, biomass, biogas, all the like, we don't know what's going to happen beyond March 2020. If you are thinking about it, project lead times, 12 months maybe, so really crack on now is my suggestion. If, if, if it's, if it's in, your, in your horizon, I'd look at it seriously now and decide once and for all because the, the opportunity may well pass. The big downside for biomass boilers as it stands is that getting CO2 from them to put in your greenhouse is a bit tough. It's possible, there is the technology, it's just expensive. Um, and for me, CO2, and that's why I've got it as a topic, sources of CO2 for the sector, for the industry, are a significant challenge looking further forward. If we're going to wean ourselves progressively off natural gas and that kind of thing, where's that CO2 going to come from? I'll move on to another sort of useful or interesting uh, renewable technology, anaerobic digestion, which again, there, there are sev several plants around here. Um, again, very interesting technology, and there, there's a, a, a sort of like a second wave of them coming at the moment for RHI reasons that I won't bore you with today. Um, and, but they are very much focused on biomethane, so that is putting methane from the digestion of, of biomass into the grid at grid quality so that the gas you're sucking out further down the pipeline, at least a percentage of it has come from a renewable source and hasn't been dug from two or three kilometres on underground. Um, but really, it's, it, it's an interesting one to look at just in terms of some of the numbers around it. The renewable heat incentive tariff for biomethane on what we call the tier one is 5.6 pence a kilowatt hour. That means that every kilowatt hour of biomethane put onto the grid, you receive a payment of 5.6 pence plus whatever the market value of the gas is. So somewhere between two and two and a half pence at the moment. Now, you do the maths, and if we assume that completely offset the CO2 content of a kilowatt hour of natural gas, it works out at 280 pounds per tonne of CO2 saved. Now just remember that number, because I'm going to put it into context in the while. 280 pounds per tonne. One or two of you might be in something wonderful called the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, and the, the co cost of carbon there is about 20 euros a tonne. So how does that compare to some other things? Well, for me, I, I suppose if only there was a renewable CO2 incentive or something, or you know, the idea of being paid anything like that to capture CO2 from other sources to use and displace burning natural gas, at that kind of level, I think it could really be quite interesting. So if I was wanting to make a bit of a political pitch for something on behalf of the industry, that, that's, that's one of my, you know, and we've heard of carbon capture and storage, which I'll talk about a little bit for a moment. Last night in the hotel, I thought, oh yeah, carbon capture and consumption, that works, isn't it? That's got a little bit of a ring. So I'll, I'll, I'll trademark that one t today, if you, if, if you like. So moving quickly on to CO2, where are we now? Well, next summer, price of gas at the moment, 60 pence a therm. If you burn <laughs> that gas in a boiler, throw the heat away because you don't want it for whatever reason, all you want is the CO2, that CO2 is going to cost you about £111 a tonne. Not much difference between that and liquid CO2 costs. If you have a nice CHP, as, as many of you do, current energy prices are such that actually if you threw the heat away, I'm not advocating that by the <coughs> way, the CO2 is maybe going to cost you £10 a tonne. Gives you a feeling of the value of CHP <coughs> in the current co commercial arena. That is operating cost only. I've ignored the few million pounds that you might have spent for a new engine <coughs> and things like that. But where next? Well, there is technology that allows us to capture CO2 from biomass. Um, a lot of it's spilled out of carbon capture and storage research. It's focused on capturing it from large power stations. <coughs> the photograph to the right is actually from a site in Canada that is doing exactly that. Um, they are capturing the CO2 from biomass, but the costs are just prohibitive. Now, we've all got to be in, live in the, the commercial world of today, and as great as we could do it now. We could build a plant tomorrow to do this, but I don't think the business will be surviving too long. But again, yes, if only we had some incentive to help us do that. Probably got this in the wrong place, but you know, we can capture CO2 from AD plants. It is happening on a small number of cases. Um, but got to be a, a lot of pieces of the jigsaw have got to drop into the right place to make, to make that viable. But it's not the most obvious step 
for, for, for the greenhouse industry. There's even, I'm sure many of you have seen, talk and systems of actually capturing CO2 from the <coughs> air, which might sound a little bit bonkers. There was only something on the BBC um, news website in recent days talk, looking at what potential costs of that could be. And they're talking about $100 a tonne. I could probably live with $100 a tonne if, that, if that's reality. So the idea of capturing CO2 from the air, probably a bit fanciful at the moment, but I, I would never say never. Particularly if I hang on to that £280 a tonne figure that's been, that's been paid out to, to anaerobic digesters. And I've not, nothing against anaerobic digesters. If you've got one, I've got lots of clients that have AD, so I, I do like you still, honestly. Uh, but it just goes to show, in terms of the orders of magnitude and the money that's been thrown in certain areas, um, how it could influence some alternative thinking. So, then I've got to go, right, so my greenhouse of the future, what, what, does that, what might that look like? I suppose some of you might say, I'm not being terribly ambitious. Well, no, next 10 or 15 <coughs> years, well, yes, plenty of you heated by biomass, but there's a lot of big sort of edible crop growers have not gone down this route because of the CO2 question and, and maybe because you've already got CHP. Electricity, I see more and more of on-site electricity being generated yourselves. And it would be nice to think that it was coming from, coming from something like a fuel cell in 10 to 15 years' time rather than just another little engine. Doesn't really feel ambitious enough that because we can do that now and I've got several people who are, who are very seriously looking at putting in 50 to 100 kilo engines for next year now. So that's hardly the greenhouse of the future. And okay, CO2 from the heat source is not that we're, we're doing that now, but what I should really have said is if CO2 be it from biomass or from alternative sources, it's so it, fundamental to greenhouse production is CO2 enrichment that we've got to have another source. Just, again, looking at greenhouse, the greenhouse as an energy partner, I know um, West Sussex Growers did a report several years ago looking at these kind of things, and, and we, we as, as, a, as a company regularly get, well, say regularly, every few months somebody will ring us up going, oh, I'm building an energy plant. We want, can someone build a greenhouse next to it, please? Um, and then we talk about CO2 quite often, and that, that pretty much ends it. Um, perhaps... We should be building greenhouses next to a CO2 source. We, no, heat, I think we can solve. CO2 sources are what we, we should be looking for. Maybe the energy project should be building next to a greenhouse, not the other way around. And also then, particularly when we're looking at greenhouses with CHP now, which have got on-site electricity surplus being exported to the grid at a lower value, should we be looking at putting high electricity, partnering high electricity users with greenhouse facilities as well so I guess just to wrap up lots of questions and challenges there, there always has been there always will be there are plenty of solutions out there some of them on the edge of being commercially proven but not commercially viable some of them ready to go but the, but the commerciality just doesn't stack up well we have solutions it just needs the commercial case to be improved to make them happen and, and many different ways that, that might, might come about but uh, I say, and I'm not just saying this because of the audience that I'm among I think protected horticulture is part of the solution to so many things whether it's healthy food and, and, and obesity and all, and all that kind of stuff or actually you know, the energy piece the, the, there's, there's so many synergies and overlaps I think you know, with the right support and incentives and all, all of these opportunities could soon drop into place and as an industry, we could make quite a useful contribution to the whole sort of energy piece for the UK. That's me. Thank you.